Hey guys and welcome to the war in space. This is season two of a collaborative process going on between me, Landstrider, Z-Tech, another three, and Lieutenant Delta. We have taken the mod, the BD Armory, and constructs to build ourselves our own bases spread across the Kerbal system. We, the brave and proud nation of Franco Muon, were forced to flee the radioactive waste of Kerbin last episode, and we have made our way out to the distant planet of Elu. The rules for this engagement are relatively simple. Every round we will get one extra base upon our base planet. Home planet, I suppose, will be the word that I'm looking for there. And each of these bases will produce 50 tons of materials for us to build our defenses and attack with. That is 50 tons in total to build with per base. And with all those excavations done, I would like to welcome you to Frankel Home. This is our home base on Elu, roughly equatorial, in fact almost exactly equatorial. And I have my first defensive satellite I wish to launch here, weighing in at a massive 3.84 tons. This takes merely a tiny dent out of my weight limit today. You can see that it is being lifted with the power of the ant engine underneath. That tiny little lifting stage underneath actually does not count towards our weight limit. One of the things we decided to do uh, in this season was to dis discount the launch vehicles i suppose that's the way discount is that really the word i'm looking for there but we we have not counted the launch vehicle in the weight allotment here you can see that elu is a, a very very light body as mentioned we're just using an ant to lift this in three a ton package up above here you can see its defensive capabilities are quite heavy we've got two lasers top and bottom the central portion there is uh the power core if you will we've got two great big batteries either side and then the inside is filled with rtgs those are the radial thermal isotope generators i was considering using solar panels but of course out in elu solar radiation is a little bit harder to come by than down in the inner solar Solar system. Solar system, Kerbal system, I'm probably going to end up using the two interchangeably, though obviously we all know I do mean the Kerbal system. Now you will see that I'm putting this in one hell of an eccentric orbit. This is entirely intentional. I have figured that by the time people get out to me, they're probably going to have a big enough behemoth of a, of a craft that they're not going to really have too much effort taking this down. Uh, I will continue this explanation in a second, but we've just released my launch vehicle here uh, it got a little stuck in the in the the uh, the workings of the of the satellite there but a quick bit of time acceleration enabled us to uh, cheaty the physics a little bit uh, phase my way through the craft and now I'm trying to make a perfect return one of the major things I have noticed here is I actually don't know where my base is from this particular point of view I know it is somewhere around these brown marks and when I originally started I was like oh is it this one on the right it's not that one on the right let me tell you it is this tiny tiny crackage on the left of the screen as we saw it so I decided just to kind of plummet backwards in the opposite direction a little bit and wait to see if I can see any trace of the base at all. It's a bit hard to do so what I do is I turn on my base management. This is a, uh, a mod that part of the constructs mod. This is the one that we used obviously to make the base. It's the one that gives us the uh, the flight controls, the flight indicators. If you've seen us flying around in the original war series is the ones with the arrows that tell us which direction to go. Uh, it takes just a little bit of time to pinpoint where I'm going and then I'm like, wait, this, this looks pretty good. I'm fairly sure I can pinpoint this landing here. So I spend the next couple of minutes trying to do so. So whilst I'm busy trying to make sure that all lines up well, let's talk about those eccentric orbits. Obviously, as the last player in the turn, I face a little bit of a disadvantage. When I would have just made my defences with, say, 50 tonnes like I've done this round, next round people are going to have 100 tonnes to come and attack me with. So I need to get a little bit sneakier, a little bit more tactical about what I do, and I've decided that trying to attack their Delta V is the way to go about this. So I'm placing orbits all around Elu in the most eccentric orbits possible, facing in totally the opposite directions. 
Pies are up. This next satellite is going to take off in a westward direction, retrograde towards the rotation of the planet. This is so we end up sending them all in different directions as previously mentioned. I will be having this one going west, another one goes south, and the last one goes east. These were all launched when the Frankel home were at 45, no, sorry, 90 degrees around the rotation of the planet. So I did one at sunup, I did one at midday, one at sundown, and one at midnight. All the defense satellites, of course, had those returnable launchers underneath them, and of course, I returned them to the exact spot where I took off from. And of course, with them all measuring in at 3.8 tons each, this means I have lifted a whopping 13.36 tons already out of my 50. Forced to flee his homeland from atomic hellfire, Jesus Kerman joins his people on a frozen planet far from the sands of home. But discontent burns with him in. He knows his peoples are destined for greater things, for he is the Messiah. Hmm? Hey? You? Stop! You. You are a Kerbal from the Desert Nation. My name is Jesus Kerman of Frankomoyoin, sinker of truth and... Why are you here? I searched the wastelands looking for answers to lead my people to great things and a glorious No, few... no, not, not that. Why are you and your people here on Iru? This was not meant to be. You are the Desert Tribe. For many years now, I've had the feeling that we were meant for more than these icy plains. When I was a small boy, there was this old lady. She used to tell us stories, and this was yes, the... Yes, yes, story with deep meaning. Very, very nice. Now, go and tell your peoples that you were meant for greater things than this icy wasteland. Deeper in the gravity well, there is a planet covered with sand. This planet was the planet meant for your peoples. The planet of Juna. And so spaketh the shrubbery of speaking that did reveal to me upon the hill of listening. It would behove us, my friends, to send an envoy to Juna, to travel in our names, and to bring the cleansing fire of our faith. The promised land will be ours! And so, being the nice democratic nation that we are, we are enacting the will of the people, sending Captain Siglo Kerman out in the Viper. You'll notice this is a solar-powered ion ship. <laughs> I couldn't think of the word there. It's a fighter. Uh, it has a little bit of a weirdness on the front. We'll talk about that at some point. Two lasers left and right at the rear. Two tweak-scaled ion drives. Now, they have been uh, made just a little bit bigger just to make them fit on the, on the parts well there. Now, this craft has a few objectives to it. Of course, number one, we have to go out to, to Juna. Uh, this, incidentally, is why it is a solar craft as opposed to all my satellites, which are on the RTGs. Obviously, we don't get much solar power out here, but look how close down to the sun I'm planning to go, or Kerbal, I suppose. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm going to make this a solar-powered craft, so that should work fine. Getting down to Juna, it turns out, is a bit of a palaver. Though I will try my best to explain what I am doing here. We're going to make a total of three separate manoeuvre nodes. The first one is to leave uh, Elu space. We need to get up and out of its sphere of influence so we can start thinking about how we're actually going to get down. Now I do this because it's quite hard to uh, predict your orbit when you are inside another sphere of influence. So I wait until I'm outside and then I make the small radial cor correction that corrects the mistiming of my launch. Now the distances involved in Kerbal Space Program are quite large and also the angles involved are very very precise. So being able to leave at exactly the right point of time in the ELU orbit is quite unlikely. It, you know, I could have done it but it's much better if I just set myself a small radial maneuver outside of ELU's sphere of influence. This uh, radial maneuver will shift my periaps sort of left and right, if you will. If I'm looking across my orbit at uh, at my periaps down past the uh, past the sun, it shifts it left and right, and this kind of corrects the timing issue. I then also have an inclination issue to try and sort out. Now, unfortunately, this means that you can never be sure that your timing correction has been performed correctly because whenever you make an inc uh, inclination 
burn, an inclination correction, you actually end up adding a little bit more to your velocity because you are still thrusting, you know, and you never get it exactly sideways. And even if you do, there's, there's still mismatchments of uh, directions to worry about. So after setting my inclination correctly, I then go back and retune the, the timing one. I, I decided to do a timing, inclination timing, sort of what uh, one, two, one again, uh, because it, I just felt that it would give me the uh, tighter tolerances on my flight. As demonstrated by the fact that this last maneuver node here actually sets up for an impact with Juna, which you don't get much tighter on the tolerance than that. Uh, four years to be waited. So I decide maybe it's time to spend the very last of my wait allowance. This is the Elu Stationary Defense Orbiter number one. I don't know, I need to come up with a better name for that. Let, let's have a competition, actually, guys. Uh, I would like some suggestions for names for this particular defense platform down in the comments below. Most likes wins. It, it's as simple as that. I know this does kind of mean that the first person to come up and show a name is the most likely to get the most ones, but hey, notification squad for the win, right? So, we're going up to Elu Stationary Orbit. Elu Stationary? Uh, I don't know. There needs to be a way of, like squishing that down but anyway the actual positioning of the station satellite we're going to call it a station there are kerbals on board this is definitely a station but the position of it you know it's not, not the, the most important part of this particular process we will whip through it at about 600 times speed i just needed to make sure that i was up at roughly the right place and you'll see that my the orbit that i used to climb up there is only ever so slightly like moving me forwards i believe that I'm currently over the top of my base. One of the hardest parts to actually get setting up one of these geo station, elo stationary, whichever stationary I am, orbit that, that we've got there, is just making sure you end up in the right place, which is quite awkward. So once again, we have this detachable lander. I really thought I was going to need a more, something with a bit more fuel than uh, what was given. And uh, oh, oh, I, we appear to have lost the footage, but everyone tells me the craft made it back safe and sound and is entirely eligible for recycling. Wonderful. We now return you to the full real-time coverage of the Viper's descent into the gravity well. We have been at this for nearly a year now, and nah, nah, let's just go to one of the uh, maneuver nodes. This is, of course, the inclination burn. This one should be for the bullseye. There shouldn't actually be anything left to do after this mere 800 meters per second delta V burn. Down at this deep in the gravity well, the energy doth flow. I have four of those gigantic solar arrays on my craft, and I, whilst I can eat through the power incredibly quickly at full power on the ion engines, it's nowhere near as big a drain as it was up in the higher reaches. I'm now just going through and doing a little bit of trim manoeuvre on my orbital prediction there. Just using my normal and anti-normal to make sure that the ion engines can get like the perfect placement. Because everything is in equatorial in the Juno system. Another three has gone along and put up two satellites, I believe, to, uh, to fend off... Uh, the Ruly Barbarians knocking at his door, I believe. Well, and here come the Barbarians. Not that I would ever describe my nation as a bunch of Barbarians. We we use ion drives to get around the solar system. How could we possibly beat the Barbarians? There we can see coming into view the two satellites and one ground defense. Not that I am overly worried about trying to hit those markers right now. I think my first concern, of course, is to just circularize my orbit and start figuring out how I can rendezvous with these crafts. I made a couple of small miscalculations while setting up this particular attack plan, maneuver node, wh whichever you want to call it here. Number one, I managed to do it inside the shadow of Juna. Not the biggest problem, like a circulation burn can happen at any point, it just means your orbit is left a little bit weird, but that, that, that can all be dealt with fairly simply. The other miscalculation I made was I did not take into account how savage on the Delta V this particular maneuver was going to be. Now that I think about it afterwards with old Captain Hindsight on my side, it is perfectly obvious that this would be my most intense maneuver of the entire mission. Munition? Munition? Yes. <laughs> So I say entirely obvious, but when I just tried to explain myself in a recording that's not going to make it in there, I realised I didn't actually understand why. And after about 20 minutes of searching on Google and looking up various things on Orbital Dynamics, 
I still don't really understand why, so I'm not going to insult any of us by trying to explain it. So after making one mistake of setting up a manoeuvre node within the Shadow of Juna, I then go and make another one immediately of setting up a rendezvous in the Shadow of Juna. Now I'd like to take, tell you a story about a parallel universe where I actually go off and do this manoeuvre node, uh, meet up with another three's satellite, blow it up, but the complications were many and varied. It was for number one too dark to see anything that was going on. There were phantom explosions. Trust me, that didn't do any damage. Plus, these lasers... Just look, look at this permanent thing stuck here for the rest of the time that I try playing with it now. So, I decided to go back just a little bit to before the rendezvous manoeuvre and try and line it up for a, a beautiful sunrise showdown because of course the video is whilst w why we are here whilst where did whilst come from we aren't doing anything else we're just here to watch some awesome video a little bit of maneuver node manipulation and of course maneuver node execution later we find ourselves approaching our target at what looks to be one and a half hundred meters per second quite slow sorry two and a half hundred the little writing on my screen is quite small we've got a little edit window on the go so at about seven kilometers i expect the sparks to begin to fly for some reason it doesn't until four if anyone can answer that one i would love to know and almost immediately all targets are off my radar. He didn't even get chance to return fire this time. That was uh, a little bit pathetic. Now, to be honest, to this day, I cannot explain why I did not immediately jump on to his second defense satellite. I was just, well, uh, my thought process was, hey, I've got this awesome bit of, ki bit of kit down here with almost infinite fuel. It's not actually infinite fuel. Obviously, that would be ridiculous. But the power of these Xenon engines are... It's really hard to overestimate how good they are, to overstate how good they are, sorry. So I deploy my solar panels and I'm like, you know what? I am going to save this ship for next time. I really wish I had put a um, docking port on there so I could dock it to a capital vessel that I could send down next time. If I had thought ahead, that would definitely what I would have done. But I'm just going to stick myself in a nice little parking orbit in between Juna and Kerbin. I, I literally no, no um, intent on my putting my periaps down at Kerbin. It's just somewhere that I can get back to Juna from relatively simply. And so we finish with this shot of Siglo Kerman radioing back to HQ saying yes indeed there is a desert planet and we should really come down and take it over. And so guys that is my setup turn. It's a bit weird that I got to attack on the setup turn but I see what's going on here. They're trying to like uh, mitigate the last person getting the disadvantage. That was a terrible way of explaining it, but I'm sure you guys get what I mean. So, for the part final people that make it all the way to the end, thank you very much for joining me this far in. It's a little bit for just you and me here. There are a few things that I would like you to do if you could possibly spare the time. Down below in the description you will find a straw poll. As with last season, this is a democratic nation. I'm going to take votes for what we're going to do. Also, comments for the name of the defensive station in Elu Stationary Orbit. We'll, we'll call it Elu Stationary Orbit until we find out what the pr proper term is for that. I, I assume that might actually be the proper term, but hey, who knows. I've had an awesome time putting this together for you guys, and hopefully you guys have enjoyed it. If you have, don't forget to hit that like button. It does give me some sort of feedback. If you can be uh, inspired to write a small comment of, of 50 words or less, you know, <laughs> then I would be very grateful for that as well. As always, thank you very much for watching, guys. I will see you later. Bye!